What is the greatest fuck it? I'll do it myself in history. Juan Pujol Garca was a Spaniard who created his own counterintelligence operation for the Allies during WW2. Initially, he approached British and American intelligence to offer them his services, but both countries rebuffed him. Undeterred, Garca created a fictional persona as a pro-fascist Spanish official and got himself recruited by the Nazis, who directed him to travel to Britain to recruit agents. Instead, Garca created a network of fictitious agents and sub-agents using publicly available information like newspapers and travel brochures. It was at this point that he again contacted Allied Intelligence, and he was finally recruited. Garka continued his work throughout the war, and for the same operation, he received both a knighthood from the British and the Iron Cross from Nazi Germany. The Nazis never realized that he was a double agent. Yes. In the lead up to Overlord he confirmed reports that the Allied attack would come from Dover and wouldn't attack Normandy. Then, at the last moment he confirmed that the Allies in fact would attack Normandy. But it was too late for the Nazis to act on it. So afterwards the Nazis still trusted him as they would point to him and say he was the only one who predicted the Normandy invasion. It was technical issues, as always, that meant the data got to us late. In 1947 a guy named Thor Heyerdahl was trying to prove his theory that the Polynesian islands were settled by people from South America, not Asia. Nobody believed him because it was thought that crossing such a large ocean with the technology they had back then was impossible. So he decides to build a boat using only the tools and materials available at the time these migrations took place. And then he sailed that boat across the Pacific Ocean, nearly dying in the process, but ultimately making it to the Polynesian Islands. Thor Heyerdahl was a bit of a madman. He also tried to prove that the ancient Egyptians could have crossed the Atlantic Ocean by rebuilding one of their boats and, well, sailing across. It took two tries, but they did it. It's still pretty unlikely that the Egyptians actually did sail across the Atlantic, but it's neat to know that they could have. Morris Heilman invented over 40 vaccines during his career in the pharmaceutical industry. In 1963 his oldest daughter caught the mumps. He cultured a sample from her, developed a vaccine, and injected it into his younger daughter. That vaccine is still in use and has saved millions of lives. In total, it's estimated that his work has saved 118 million lives globally. And because he used it on his daughter it is to this day the fastest any effective vaccine has ever been produced. Nikola Tesla was tasked with lighting up the world's fair, but Thomas Edison wouldn't allow him to use any of his patents, so Tesla had to invent a new light bulb that didn't use any of Edison's patents and could still have thousands made in time for the event. Tesla was definitely one of the most underrated geniuses of his time. I believe he died penniless in 1943. Jon Snow, not that one, the father of epidemiology. No one believed him that the cholera outbreak in what is now Soho was because of a contaminated water pump. He broke it. They arrested him for vandalism and held him until the outbreak suddenly ended. Edit, corrected the location. He was also a pioneer when it came to anesthetics. Queen Victoria permitted him to put her under for the birth of two of her children. I visited his memorial in Brompton Cemetery a few years ago. Has right round the corner from Emmeline Pankhurst's grave. Both sites had fresh flowers on them. Otis invented pretty much what we consider the modern elevator. Nobody was convinced it was safe, so he hoisted himself up extremely high and had somebody cut the cable with an axe to prove how confident he was that the elevator was safe regardless of almost worst case scenarios. Otis UK are based in Reading. When they answer the phone they say hello, Otis Reading. Perhaps when no one believed Barry Marshall that H. pylori can cause stomach ulcers, so he thought screw it, I'll test it on myself, and ended up getting the Nobel Prize. Edit, wow I did not expect this to get so many upvotes, also thank you folks for the Bo Awards. However, I feel it's necessary to point out that Robin Warren, the co-winner of the Nobel Prize, has actually done most of the work for the discovery, but Marshall got all the attention well because of doing this. Thank you you slash Ramiel01 for reminding us. Bless him. I have an ulcer, and because of him, we have a better understanding of how to treat it. The doctor stationed in Antarctica that removed his own appendix. Got him. 
Wasn't that more like, duck me, I have to do it myself. Brian Acton interviewed at Facebook and got turned down. He said duck it and built WhatsApp. Several years later, Facebook bought WhatsApp for $19 billion edit. Twitter here is his tweet from 2009 the day he interviewed. I'm getting this framed for my desk at work. I downloaded it for free. Cliff Stahl, the cuckoo's egg, noticed weird traffic on his university servers. No one believed him that there was any risk occurring. Ended up uncovering a major hacking attempt to steal missile designs and basically created internet security. I think it was missile designs. It's been a long time. Removed. In 1888, Alman Brown Strouger, an undertaker, noticed he was losing a lot of business to the other undertaker in town. He found out that the other undertaker's wife was a telephone operator, and when she intercepted people asking to be connected to Strouger's funeral home, the operator would route the call to her husband's funeral home instead. Three years later, Strouger patented the automatic teller exchange, a system which allowed telephone users to make calls without the need for human operators, single-handedly destroying an entire workforce. Imagine being so pissed off you don't just get someone fired, but remove their job from existence entirely. James Clerk Maxwell was idolized by Einstein as being the father of modern physics. Not only did he formulate the clavicle theory of electromagnetic radiation, but just for chizzes and giggles he calculated exactly what Saturn's rings were made from using pure mathematics. It wasn't until Voyager 1 and 2 part by and took photos in the early 80s did we get confirmation that Maxwell was right. He then calculated how to take a color photograph in 1855. This was then achieved in 1861 and is recognized as the first ever color photograph. Don't forget his advances in statistical mechanics. Probably the time Nando Parado and Roberto Canessa decided they couldn't wait around any longer and legged it for 10 days across the Andes with no warm clothes, climbing gear, or food except some scraps of their dead friends stuffed into a sock. They finally found someone out in the middle of nowhere, Sergio Catalan, who rode horseback all night and then took a bus to get some help. The mountain climbers had come from the wreckage of a crashed plane that everyone had been looking for for over two MOs. They needed help for the other survivors who were injured and starving. They saved 14 of their friends. There's a book written about it by one of the survivors himself, Miracle in the Ants. 72 days on the mountain in my long trek home by Nando Parado. I never watched the movie, but the book still gets me to this day. It is one of the most disturbing depictions of humans' ability to survive even under the deadliest circumstances. A really humbling read, reminding us of our own fragility and how terrible fleeting everything truly is. Jonas Salk needed human subjects to test his polio vaccine. That's normally a long process and he wanted to make the vaccine available as quick as possible, so he just experimented on himself. He also didn't patent the polio vaccine I believe, and he tried to help fight the AIDS epidemic even before he died. Henry VIII couldn't get his way with the Pope, so made he made the Church of England, so he could do what he wanted. This man legit made his own damn religion, which millions still follow today, just so he could cheat on his wife edit. He was already cheating on his wife, he wanted to divorce her to marry his mistress. It's gotta be Amo Corgan and he was a Finnish soldier in the Second World War when the Finns were trying to reclaim land from the Soviets. He got separated from his unit mid-war in the middle of nowhere he was the one tasked to carry the drugs they held in case of injury or tiredness, one of which was pervitin, which was literal meth in a tablet form. Instead of just taking one or two, he downed the whole bottle and went on a weeks long methed up rampage. He got hit by a landmine, evaded Soviet soldiers caught a bird, and ate it raw, all while on skis. He finally made it back to finish lines where on arrival, he weighed only 90 pounds or so, and had a heart rate of 200 beats per minute. He ended up living for another 45 years. Edit, here's an article, if you want to read more, and see a pic of his unyielding stare. I ducking love it, whenever this story gets mentioned. It's so crazy as to be unbelievable but it's true. A movie needs to be made about this guy. A man who was a tractor mechanic company owner made a good chunk of money and bought a Ferrari. 
He felt that the car wasn't as good as it could be and it wasn't very comfortable, so he brought his complaints all the way to Enzo Ferrari, the owner of the company. Enzo insulted the man, saying a mere tractor mechanic didn't know how to make a sports car. That sparked a rivalry that lasts to this day. That man was Firaxio Lamborghini. Edit. Thanks to you slash TDS755 and you slash King Chimelian07 for correcting me. Tractor mechanic? Italian manufacturing magnet. Lamborghini tractors are still produced, although not by the car company. When Julius Caesar decided to just up and ducking march into Rome to declare himself the military leader, or how about his Rhine bridges that he built in a few days to cross an army over a river, then went back over and demolished it just because his army could. It said the Germanic tribe saw his army do this and basically chis themselves. Imagine being some nomadic tribe and an invading force comes to a river, builds an entire bridge, crosses it, chises in your land, and then goes back home and destroys the entire bridge all in less than a week. Not a very old story. Manchi or the mountain men lived in a very remote village of India whose route to nearby was blocked a mountain and hence villagers had to climb it every time. And they had to do that daily to get essential supplies. During one of these trips, his wife fell down the mountain. He loved her alit. He tried first to persuade the gov to do a mountain tunnel project there but to vain. So he went on alone to break the entire mountain with just an axe. He did that for 10 plus years and finally succeeded. There is a Bollywood movie on him too, title, Manji, The Mountain Man. I feel like he went through a lot of axes lol. That's pretty impressive though. Donald Nuff is one of the big names in computer science. Back in the 1960s he set out to write the definitive texts on computer programming and analysis of algorithms. The first three volumes came out and he started the fourth in the early slash mid 1970s. He was unhappy with how the newer printing slash editions were typeset, and so he took a summer to solve that problem. A decade later the fourth volume still had not been completed, but as a consolation prize we got TX, later extended to the more commonly used LaTeX, without question the most comprehensive and powerful language for creating documents with heavy technical requirements. It is a strange mix of a markup language like HTML and a compiled language like C. It is completely free, and has been for well over 30 years, and is probably the most bug-free piece of software I've ever seen. Certainly for its size and scope, there's not much out there of comparable quality. There is literally no mathematics that cannot be properly typeset in text slash latex. Its default style is instantly recognizable to any working mathematician. It is used across nearly all STEM fields and there are hundreds, if not thousands, of journals that only accept manuscripts written in LaTeX. It wasn't until the early 2000s that drafts of the fourth volume started to appear. Nobody has seemed to mind. I use LaTeX all the time, tossed word processors in the trash. I found it helps with writing, when you're not fidgeting with formatting. Let's you focus. It is very annoying when a submission requires a Word document instead of allowing a PDF. The conversion for LaTeX to Word doc or OpenDoc just isn't good enough for a lot of mathematical equations, charts, graphs, etc. Edit, I know. Pandoc. It gets the closest, but still has some issues. When Nintendo turned down a collab with Sony, then Sony said, duck it, we'll do it ourself. The rest is history. To be fair, I think it's great they did. Nintendo and Sony are so different, there's plenty of room for both. During the American Revolution, John Paul Jones sailed over to England to burn down British naval ships. He succeeded of course and made back safely. After the revolution he was even pardoned by the town that he burned most of the ships in. And then he met Jimmy Page and Robert Plant and the rest is history. I'm surprised no one's mentioned Catherine the Great of Russia. She decided her husband was useless, which, granted, he was, and proceeded to set up a military coup to overthrow him. Even with the plan being discovered early, she dressed herself in military garb and marched with her new army, which had just sworn loyalty to her, down to Peter's palace, where he was forced to resign the throne, all without a single drop of bloodshed. At least until Peter turned up dead sometime later under shady circumstances, but honestly for a military coup it was pretty non-violent. 
If saying duck it, I'm ruling Russia myself isn't great, I don't know what is. I mean, it's right there next to her name for a reason. It's incredible, especially considering, A, she's a lady, B, she wasn't Russian, C, she wasn't originally Russian Orthodox. Desmond Doss, single-handedly saved from 50 to 100 men up on Hacks Origin Okinawa. His company was ordered to retreat when they were attacked by the Japanese, but instead he said nah, stayed up on the ridge alone, unarmed, and dragged as many soldiers as he could to safety without any help. Even when he was shot by a sniper and riddled with shrapnel, he made sure they took another guy down the hillside before him. Edit, I'm aware there is a movie. I've read about him before, and I know he's done more than just what is in the movie. I just didn't want to make a 3000 word post about the many ways this guy is amazing. Australian stretcher bearer Leslie Allen did a similar thing on Mount Tambu. Carried out 12 men one at a time on his back alone. Received a silver star. The guy who started FedEx wrote a college paper about a nationwide overnight shipping company and got a C. Started the company anyways. Later after he started it, and it was struggling, he couldn't get a loan and the company was almost bankrupt, and he bet next week's payroll at the casino on roulette and won. Also got a silver star in the Vietnam War and now co-owns the Washington Redskins. The latter often viewed as the biggest failure in his life. It was blackjack, not roulette. George Clooney. Bought his own spy satellite to prove the alleged crimes of an African warlords, because nobody else would. He bought satellite time, not an entire spy satellite. Low Major, he liberated an entire village from Nazis by himself, he's one of the handful of super bad soldiers you sometimes hear about from WW2. Audie Murphy 2. Leroy Jenkins, oh my god, he just ran in. The dude in the war with wounded fingers. A doctor wouldn't amputate them, so he bit them off himself. My great grandpa did the opposite, they were gonna amputate his feet in WW2, and he said nap, so he went a while and treated his wounded feet on his own. When he came back with two perfectly good feet he basically said, I wanted to keep my feet and I wanted to keep fighting. And as far as I know he didn't get any kind of punishment, even though he was gone for weeks. Close street I can think of is Owen Rommel during the Blitzkrieg seeing an opportunity to make an exploit, and instead of waiting said duck it, and charged 200 miles into French territory, which is interesting, since in WW1 the German leader, can't remember his name, pushed beyond where he was supposed to since the French resistance sucked, but it partially cost them the war for overextending. Clara Lemlich taking the stage at a union meeting in 1909 to declare a general strike after the older male union leaders told the working girls that there really wasn't a point in striking and it would be too hard, just be patient and deal with it. So 20 year old Clara interrupts them, climbs up on the stage and shouts at the crowd that she's tired of just talk, time to strike. And everyone went for it, instant agreement of the workers. Wow, this got some attention, so editing to add that I dug up my old research, a translation of what she said, originally in Yiddish, was I have listened to all the speeches, and I have no further patience for talk. I too, have worked and suffered, and I'm tired of talk. I move that we go on general strike. Now, which union? Canadian soldier Leo Major and his friend Willy Arsenault were scouting a Dutch town called Zwaal that had been captured by Germans in WW2. On this scouting trip, the two had decided to liberate Zwaal together, but were spotted and Arsenault was killed. Major, enraged, killed two Germans, while the rest fled. On the outskirts of the town, Major intercepted a vehicle, disarming the soldiers there. He told a French-speaking soldier that all the Canadian artillery would be firing on the town in the morning, and decidedly let the Nazi free to spread the rumor, even returning his weapon as a total alpha move. That night, Major decided to single-handedly liberate the town. Arming himself with many weapons, he made explosions and noise, making it sound like the entire Canadian army was there. Several times that night, Major went back and forth from Zwoll to the Canadian base taking 8 to 10 German prisoners each time. At one point, Major located the Gestapo, high-ranking Nazis, headquarters and raided it himself. He killed several SS officers and the rest fled. By morning, 
Major discovered that the Germans who had taken Zwal had entirely retreated. I should also mention that Major was a sniper who had only one eye from a phosphorus grenade explosion years prior, and remained in the military because he insisted he only needed one eye to aim his weapon and that to him, he looked like a pirate. The Dutch town of Zwal was liberated by a one-eyed sniper. He has several other legendary acts, but this to me was his best. Edit, some details, including the return of an arts's weapon. This is by turns, bad a hilarious brilliant pirate. Sewards decision to buy Alaska from Russia. Best folly ever. The giant Norse axeman who held the chocker point at the Battle of Stamford Bridge. By the time the bulk of the English army had arrived, the Vikings on the west side were either slain or fleeing across the bridge. The English advance was then delayed by the need to pass through the choke point presented by the bridge itself. The Anglo-Saxon Chronicle has it that a giant Norse axeman, possibly armed with a Danax, blocked the narrow crossing and single-handedly held up the entire English army. The story is that this axeman cut down up to 40 Englishmen and was defeated only when an English soldier floated under the bridge in a half barrel and thrust his spear through the planks in the bridge, mortally wounding the axeman. 15 Wikipedia. The whole story behind this period of English history is really interesting, actually. Basically one king, Edward the Confessor, died and there was no obvious successor. There were four options. Harold Godwinson, king's brother-in-law and powerful popular nobleman. Harold Hardrada, Norse king and distant cousin, a nephew whose name I can't remember, a child, or William the Dastard, Duke of Normandy, claimed the throne was promised to him by the dead king. The Council of Lords sat down and decided that Harold Godwinson was the best choice, and he was crowned basically immediately. This annoyed William and Harold. William started getting an army together, and Harold basically had to call up everyone he could into military service to fend off the invasion. Harold made his best guess about when and where the Normans would invade, but obviously it's not that simple and his army was sitting around at the ready, on high alert for weeks and weeks. Finally, it hit the point that he couldn't keep the army together anymore, and they basically disbanded. The Vikings, led by Harold Hardrada, took this moment to invade England in the north. They sailed in, marched for a bit, and then set up camp. Harold Godwinson scrambled his army back together and marched, marched. Cavalry was not a thing in England at this time, 185 miles in 4 days, to get to Stamford Bridge, where they discovered the Vikings chilling, because there was no way that the English could arrive from the south for at least a week or two. Then the Battle of Stamford Bridge happened, the English won in a resounding victory, and Harold received news that William the Dastard had landed at Hastings. So he turned his army around and marched them back to the south. Three weeks later, Harold Godwinson faced William of Normandy at a little hill called Battle. William the Dastard became William the Conqueror, and the rest is history. Metallica fired Dave Mustaine, 1983, because he was sort of a control freak and wanted to take the band in a more prog slash jazz metal direction. He was also abusing drugs and was known for violent behavior at the time. He went off and created his own band Megadeth, and over the next 30 plus years he sold millions of albums and toured the whole world writing and controlling pretty much everything he's ever wanted. It seems they've all now patched things up. Jude is an absolute genius beast of a guitarist slash songwriter. Also, when guitarist Hillel Slovak died, 1988, John Frusciant was a 19 years old kid and a huge fan of the Red Hot Chili Peppers. He was heartbroken and didn't want to see the end of his favorite band. So he went and auditioned to play lead guitar. He got the gig. Helped take them to the top of the charts. The rest is history. Today he's considered one of the greatest rock guitarists out there. I do love Megadeth, but I wouldn't want to be in a band with Dave Mustaine. It's a weird win-win-win situation. Metallica didn't have to deal with Dave. Dave got to go and be Dave, and we got to enjoy both Metallica and Megadeth. Alexander the Great solving the Gordian, not by cutting it with his sword. Alexander loved to do things like this. During the Maolian campaign near the end of his conquests, his army was besieging a citadel. Alexander thought the battle was taking too long, so he took a ladder, climbed up the citadel wall himself, and suicidally jumped over the wall into the heart of the enemy garrison. 
He sustained awful injuries during this battle, but perhaps in part due to his recklessness, his army was able to complete the siege of the citadel. We had a client that had his books and processes so messed up, we were doing almost a thousand journal entries a month to make corrections. He had five full-time people in accounting when he could have gotten away with one accountant and one cheap part-time billing person. He got tired of our bills and hearing us make recommendations, so he finally said I'll do it myself. All five of his people quit over the next few months, and last I heard, they weren't even able to bill customers. I recently just trained one of our clients bookkeepers how to record some regular transactions, and how to make the adjusting entries we sent back to them at year's end. 10 years, and hundreds upon hundreds of clients, and I finally found one who would listen, and was appreciative of the time we took to show her what to do. This ultimately lowered our billing with the client, but her boss, our client, is a client for life now, because of the value we provided. The referrals are paying more than enough dividends for the lost revenue on the initial client. Hannibal of Carthage deciding to take his army over the Alps includes war elephants. Defeated every Roman he crossed and definitely could have taken Rome itself if he'd received reinforcement and siege artillery. But the Carthaginian senators were lining their pockets with Roman bribes in return for voting against sending reinforcement. Spoiler alert, it did not end well. Wasn't there that Russian, of course he was Russian, doctor that did stomach surgery on himself with only a bottle of vodka for anesthetic. He was stuck in Antarctica and was the only doctor available. He got a group of people to hold mirrors and hand him stuff and had another group for if anyone part out. He then took out his own appendix. Martine Rothblatt founder of Sirius XM and unbelievable polymath, was told her daughter Genesis had three months to live. She had been diagnosed with a type of pulmonary arterial hypertension which was fatal. The disease causes too much pressure in the blood vessels leading from the heart to the lungs, causing them to narrow and not carry enough oxygen. So Rothblatt quit all of her other work and went to the library to save her daughter. Even though she had zero background in the field, she figured out a cure, and in the process, founded United Therapeutics which is a billion dollar biotechnology company. Rothblatt's life story is amazing. What was the cure? Let's not forget that Isaac Newton ran out of math to work with and was like I guess I'll just invent calculus then. He was self-quarantined during the plague. The story of calculus. If I have seen further it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. When Pedro Serrano realized Joe Blue wasn't going to help him hit a damn curveball. Even has the quote to go with it when he says I say duck you Joe Boo, I do it myself. Lamborghini building cars because Duck Ferrari, the owner of Lamborghini ran a successful tractor company. When he asked Enzo Ferrari to make some customizations to a vehicle he was about to purchase, Enzo replied with something along the lines of, you should stick to what you know, tractor boy. Thus, the Lamborghini car company was started and allows customers to customize almost any feature of their vehicle. Lioness of Brittany Wikipedia. My revenge is one hell of a name for a pirate ship that gets a point across. I've posted this guy before. Total bad A. Eh? Scroll down and read the moth citation. While you read that, remember that this happened after he stepped on a landmine a few years earlier and taught himself how to walk again. Wikipedia. When Princess Vespa's hair got singed. Not bad not bad for Rambo. The Soviet woman that lost her husband to the Nazis sold everything and to pay for a tank with the request that she gets to drive it to fight Nazis. Go read up about Mirai Roktaya Briskaya on Wikipedia. Mirai Roktobla Tankaya. Stanislav Petrov making the decision not to push the button to launch nuclear missiles, as would have been his direct orders when the Russian early warning system wrongly indicated the launch of American missiles in 1983. One man saved the entire world from nuclear destruction. So this is undeniably the greatest of these moments in all human history. There should be a statue of him in every major city around the world. Edit. Spelling edit. More spelling. Herbert Hoover. Biographical book review its late star codex his whole life is a cyclical story of, here's a problem. Nobody can solve it. Give me total control. 
He then takes total control, offends literally everyone involved, and fixes everything. You probably remember Herbert Hoover as the guy who bungled the Great Depression. Maybe you shouldn't. Maybe you should remember him as a bold explorer looking for silver in the jungles of Burma. Or as a heroic defender of teens enduring the Boxer Rebellion. Or as a dashing pirate philanthropist, gallivanting around the world, saving millions of lives wherever he went. Or as the temporary dictator of Europe. Or as a geologist, or a bank tycoon, or author of the premier 1900s textbook on metallurgy. How did a backwards orphan son of a blacksmith, dropped in the middle of a forgotten spot in the Midwest, grow up to be a captain of industry and a US president? How did he become such a towering figure in the history of philanthropy that biographer Kenneth White claims the number of lives Hoover saved through his various humanitarian campaigns might exceed 100 million, a record of benevolence unlike anything in human history. To find out, I picked up White's Hoover, An Extraordinary Life in Extraordinary Times. Edit, just one of the hilarious summary snippets of his life, Herbert Hoover is the first student at Stanford. Not just a member of the first graduating club, literally the first student. He arrives at the dorms two months early to get a head start on various money-making schemes, including distributing newspapers, delivering laundry, tending livestock, and helping other students register. He would later sell some of these businesses to other students and start more, operating a constant churn of enterprises throughout his college career. His academics remain mediocre, and he continues to have few friends, until he tries out for the football team in sophomore year. He has zero athletic talent and fails miserably, but the coach, whose eye for talent apparently transcends athletics, spots potential in Hoover, and asks him to come on as team manager. In this role, Hoover is an unqualified success. He turns the team's debt into a surplus, and starts the big game Ruck Berkeley vs. Stanford football match played on Thanksgiving which remains a beloved Stanford football tradition. Other Stanford students notice his competence, and by his senior year he is running, not just the football team, but the baseball team, a lecture series, a set of concerts and plays, and much of the student government. The female orgasm. Welp. Never been castrated by a joke before so that's new. Here's a notable mention, albeit somewhat obscure. Sam Regenstreif once made 40% of the dishwashers in the USA at the time. He fell ill with a kidney stone and went to his local hospital in Indiana. Upon leaving, he was disgusted by the waiting times and quality of care. He took matters into his own hands and created a hospital and founded the Regenstreif Institute. This institute helped map the genome of COVID-19 and translated its finding into 20 plus languages helping the world fight this virus. Edit, showing me with all the treasure, my first time gold and silver, I'm thrilled. Dave Grohl, the drummer for Nirvana became unemployed after the lead singer killed himself while on copious amounts of drugs. Shortly thereafter he created a new band for which there were no members yet other than himself. He written the music, lyrics and well as played vocals, backup vocals, drums, bass and guitar by himself. For fighter's name was an afterthought, so people wouldn't recognize him right away as a member of Nirvana. The self-titled album for fighters is also the second highest selling album by the 25 year career of the band. Dave Grohl was unemployed? That is pretty misleading. You make it sound like after Kurt died Dave had nowhere to go, so he had to scrape together a band. Dave was horribly depressed and didn't want to make any music or even listen to it following Kurt's death, but he was already a renowned songwriter in addition to the drumming and was recruited by Pearl Jam and Tom Petty, among others, before creating the Foo Fighters. He took a few months off to get himself together, not to work at a gas station lol he was famous and rich as Duck. And by the way, the self-titled first album, while excellent, barely cracks the top 5 of their top selling albums. During the American Civil War, General McClellan was in charge of the Army of the Potomac. He was an overcautious kind of officer, and he wasn't doing enough to move against Lee's Army of Northern Virginia. Lincoln got fed up with the inaction, and wrote him a letter in which he asked his general if he could borrow the army, since you're not using it for anything. McClellan is one of those individuals who gets unfairly maligned by historians because he didn't get along with Lincoln. Lincoln was actually a pretty bad armchair general. 
Lincoln's orders hamstringed McClellan's Peninsula campaign in which McClellan had successfully outmaneuvered the Confederates. McClellan was cautious but that's because he didn't want to see his soldiers market senselessly. McClellan never had a disastrous defeat like Hooker did at Chancellorsville or Pope did at Second Manus. Lincoln replaced McClellan with Burnside. Burnside didn't think he would make a good army commander and told Lincoln as much. Lincoln pressured him to take the position and pressured him to attack, which Burnside did, resulting in the bloody Union defeat at Fredericksburg. The first thing that comes to thought here is the Louisiana Purchase. Congress planned on buying a small piece of the available land, but Jefferson used some interpretation duckery to double the size of the US without congressional approval. Dashrath Manji the Mountain Man. Dude carved a way through a mountain single-handedly to pave a shorter way to a hospital because his wife died due to the lack of treatment after falling from the same mountain. It took him 22 years. The authorities did not react so he did. This happened in rural India and there's a movie about him. When Sony and Nintendo partnered for a CD add-on for the SNES, but Nintendo decided to partner with Philips instead leaving Sony behind. Sony took all the knowledge about video games that they learned from working with Nintendo and created the PlayStation. All the while Nintendo was still buying the sound chips for the SNES from Sony. The guy who made body armor shot himself to test it. I mean, I'd use a test dummy the first few times. Tommy Wiseau couldn't land an acting job in Hollywood, so he wrote, produced, directed, and starred in his own movie despite having no experience in any of those things. The rest is history. Claim to direct. Netflix. Blockbuster really pissed that guy off. Interestingly enough I used to work with a guy who was with Blockbuster at the time. Turns out Blockbuster didn't par on Netflix, they just didn't have the capital to acquire it, lock, stock and brand. Everything was history after that. Well if you mean greatest as in most badder, probably when Andrew Jackson beat the hell out of his would be Owen and had to be pulled off by his own bodyguards. If you mean most well known, probably in the bible when little David messed up Goliath and then started a kingdom. I also love Andrew Jackson dying. I have but two regrets, that I did not hand John C. Callahan, and that I did not shoot Henry a Clay. His parrot also had to be removed from his funeral for having such a foul mouth, beak. Liana Drogas of removing his own appendix or in Ezra Meyer's Perez doing her own C-section. Rogozov was a Dr. Perez a poor Mexican woman. Sir Anulfi ends after an expedition, I think to the Arctic, had frostbitten digits on one hand. After becoming irritated and uncomfortable waiting for the docs to sort out treatment, he went to his garden shed and amputated them himself. Linus Torvalds was thrashing SVN. They said well, can you do better? Now everyone uses JIT. Edit, you mean his name isn't Linux Torvalds? Uh, not quite. It was because Bidkeeper decided to disallow the kernel devs to continue using it for free. Nothing to do with SVN. I won't say it's the greatest in history, but Mate Pantrainer pitched all about that bait to countless songwriters who decided not to record it, notably Adele and Beyonce. So she decided to release it herself, shooting to hash one and launching her artist career. Imagine Adele recording all about that bay. I'm so 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 glad she didn't. Thomas Jefferson thought the US should expand and Napoleon needed cash. Jefferson was an advocate for very limited federal government though, and wanted to find some way other than the federal government buying it. Finally, with no other choice, he said duck it and bought it, losing all credibility among his followers WRT having a small federal government. That could be completely incorrect, something somebody made up and I believed. The Lewis and Clark expedition was similar. He had them set out for one reason, and then covered the trip for another instead. Killing Hitler? For the last track of their album Innuendo, Queen was arguing about if Freddie Mercury was healthy enough to sing. May states I said Fred, I don't know if this is going to be possible to sing. And he went, I'll ducking do it, darling he put his vodka down and recorded the entire song in one take. Reading this I was like this has to be the show must go on, and happily it was. Amazing track holy hell. That guy who got his arm jammed while rock climbing, so he amputated it with a toothpick and some pocket lint. 
might be a different guy, but if you're talking about the guy who wrote the book between a rock and a hard place he amputated it with a dull pocket knife. John Paul Jones literally just went to the UK and captured a bunch of ships during the Revolutionary War. Keep in mind, he just had a small fleet of merchant ships. And he was pretty good on Bay 2. Oh my. You watched until the end? That's ducking awesome dude. Thanks for watching.